All this week, we've been looking at the five final psalms of the Psalter, the five final psalms of the book of Psalms, because this is called the Hallel, or the praise of the book of Psalms. The last five psalms of the book begin with the words, Hallelujah, and each one ends with the words, Hallelujah. I say words because in the English language, that's praise the Lord, and that's what we want to do in this occasion. We want to praise the Lord God. Now today, we're going to look at Psalm 149, and tomorrow, the final psalm, Psalm 150. I'm happy you've joined us today because Psalm 149 is the victory psalm. And if we need victory in any area of our lives, we need to remember to praise the Lord for that victory, to thank Him for that victory. Now, Psalm 149 is a jubilant psalm, an exultant psalm. It's a psalm in celebration of victory. And like so many other of the psalms in these last five psalms of the Bible, the Hallel, Psalm 149 appears best to fit at a later date in Israel's history, perhaps after the return of Nehemiah and the men and women of Israel from Babylonian captivity. Unfortunately, however, there is a problem with this psalm. Well, not so much a problem with the psalm as with those who have read it and misinterpreted it. This psalm has been misunderstood and badly misused by some people within the church. It was the means by this psalm that Caspar Scopius, in his book, Clarion of the Sacred War, inflamed princes and initiated the Thirty Years' War. So inflammatory was that work that it was said to have been written not with ink, but with blood. So the psalm was used on one occasion to call men to battle against other men. And Thomas Munzer also initiated the War of the Peasant by using this psalm as a call to battle. Now, each of these wars pitted one faction of the church against another faction. When we forget, when the church forgets the words of the Apostle Paul, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Then the church falls back upon the ground of the Old Testament. And folks, we must never allow that to happen. Let's take a look at this great hymn of praise and receive from it, not the call to war, but the call to praise. Psalm 149 is a call to praise for the victory the Lord gives us. Psalm 149 seems to divide itself in three stanzas. There is first the call to praise, verses 1 through 3, and then the cause for praise, verse 4, and finally the consequences of praise, verses 5 through 9. Let's notice it in that order. First, the call to praise, Psalm 149, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song and His praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in their Maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their King. Let them praise His name with the dance. Let them sing praises to Him with the timbrel and the harp. Praise the Lord. Now, isn't it interesting that this psalm begins not just with a hallelujah, but it also begins with calling us to sing to the Lord a new song. What do you suppose that meant for the Israelites? Well, I think it probably meant that their new song would have been an account of their latest deliverance, and that would be the deliverance from Babylonian captivity. The same thing was true back in Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to Him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. Yes, I think for these Old Testament Israelites, the new song was the song of God's deliverance from Babylonian captivity. But for us today, oh, friends, for us, the new song is clearly one of release from eternal captivity. Our new song is the song of the redeemed. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. I was lost, but Jesus found me found the sheep that went astray, threw his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. 
That's our song today. That's our new song today that Jesus Christ saves. Today we have a new song because we have a new covenant. We have entered a new relationship with God. As Augustine once said, The old man hath an old song, the new man a new song. The Old Testament is an old song, the New Testament is a new song. Whoso loveth earthly things singeth an old song. Let him that desireth to sing a new song love the things of eternity. That's what we want to do today. We want to sing a new song, a song of Christ's redeeming love, a song of the future, not a song of the past. So notice in verse 1 it says, Sing to the Lord a new song, and then, And his praise in the congregation of saints. For the Lord to receive our new song is pleasure to his ears. But for him to receive praise in the congregation of saints is like receiving a diamond-studded crown as opposed to a solitary crown. Personal praise is sweet, but the praise of the congregation of saints is sweeter still. That's why we go to church, friends. We don't go to church to get a blessing. We go to church because the corporate congregation before the Lord makes sweet songs to the Lord. So let's be faithful in going to our place of worship this weekend, and let's be faithful in praising the Lord when we get there. His praise in the congregation of the saints brings him great joy. Praise the Lord. Verse 2, Let Israel rejoice in their Maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their King. Now, did you notice here in verse 2 that the Jews of Israel are not to rejoice in what their king does for them, but in their king? You see, folks, our joy is in God. Our joy does not stem from what God can do for us, but from the fact that He is God. So today, as you praise the Lord God, don't praise Him for all the good things He's done for you. Well, don't praise Him only for all the good things He's done for you. Praise Him for who He is as well. The greatest joy that you and I have ought to be the joy we have in God, not the joy we have from God. The third verse continues this call to praise. Psalm 149, verse 3, Let them praise His name with the dance. Let them sing praises to Him with the timbrel and harp. Now, in the life of early Israel, dancing was one of the most expressive modes of religious joy. It was done all the time. You remember Exodus chapter 15, verse 20. It tells us of the song sung by Moses and the Israelites after they crossed the Red Sea on dry land. It says, Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. Yes, these Israelites crossed on dry ground, and they immediately began to sing and dance in celebration of what God had done for them. And do you remember when David brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem? Then David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the Ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. 2 Samuel 6, verses 14 and 15. So dance was part of the celebration of Old Testament Israel. But it's interesting, friends, I find it very interesting that the New Testament is silent on dancing. In fact, in the New Testament, we're counseled to be admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, Colossians 3.16. Nowhere are we told that dancing is to accompany that singing. It just doesn't say that. Maybe the reason for that is that by the New Testament era, the wild dances of the mystery religions of ancient Greece were so lewd, so lustful, that dancing became an inappropriate means of praising the Lord. And much of the dance today falls into the dirty dancing category and is also not conducive to lifting our hearts toward God. But for ancient Israel, dancing and singing went hand in hand. Went hand in hand because they were called to praise the Lord God, and that's the way they did it. Verses 1 through 3 call us to a new song, a fresh musical. We're to appear in new forms of praise. Let's praise the Lord together. 
Well, verse 4 talks about the cause for praise. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation, the meek with salvation. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. That word takes pleasure in is the Hebrew word for satisfying a debt or to be pleased with. You see, the Lord takes pleasure in us as if our debt to sin was satisfied. Oh, in fact, friends, through the blood of Jesus Christ, it is satisfied. And that's why God takes so much pleasure in us. But what wonderful condescension to see that the mighty Jehovah, the one who gives us a new song, would actually take pleasure in our praise of him. Think about it, friends. God takes pleasure in you. God takes pleasure in me. God takes pleasure in us when we praise him. He will beautify the meek or the humble with salvation. That word beautify means to embellish. It's also the same word to shake a tree or to go over the boughs of a tree. Sometimes beautifying requires pruning, doesn't it? Every time God goes over our boughs, every time he prunes us, shapes us, crafts us, it hurts. But it leads to ultimate beauty in him. This is not makeup we're talking about here. It's not simply cosmetic. This is the work of God and his people to make all things beautiful in his time. We're called to praise and we're given the reason or the cause for our praise because God takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Then finally today, verses 5 through 9 talk about the consequences of praise. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Now these saints are the pious ones, the holy ones. The Hebrew word is hasid. You know of the Hasidic Jews, those pious Jews who wear black and have the black curls of hair along the sides of their heads. What's well, the same word? Let them sing aloud on their beds, he says, all who want to be holy, all who want to be godly or pious. You see, even confined by sickness, shut in or during the loneliness of the hours of the midnight, saints of God know that we're not alone and we're encouraged to let the high praises of God be in our mouths. But the saints are not always depicted as languishing on their beds during the midnight hours. You see, folks, praise and prayer go hand in hand, and saints are depicted as having two-edged swords in their hands. Now, I think for the Israelites, this was a literal weapon. You remember in Nehemiah's day, they were to be vigilant against the enemy, Nehemiah chapter 4, Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem. These men were threatening the virtual destruction of the program of rebuilding Jerusalem's wall. For Israel, the two-edged sword was a literal sword, and it was deadly. But folks, it is no coincidence that the book of Hebrews describes the word of God as quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Today, converts are not made with a steel sword, but with the quickening power of the word of God. You see, we fight against principalities and powers. We fight in the power of God's Holy Spirit. And metaphorically, for those who have a new song to sing, the song of redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ, the two-edged sword is to be used against the prince of the power of the air. You and I, friends, do battle in spiritual realms. Verse 7, 8, and 9. To execute vengeance on the nations, the punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment, this honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. Now, the New Testament saint cannot literally claim these promises for his own. They refer historically to Israel's victory in the hands of God. Nevertheless, we can join in praise of the Lord for the spiritual victories he gives us. Every time you get victory over tobacco or alcohol or drugs, praise the Lord. Every time you get victory over sex addiction, pornography, or some other form of deviation, praise the Lord. Every time you beat Satan back in your life and get victory over anger, jealousy, bitterness, or gossip, praise the Lord. 
Now, folks, sing to the Lord a new song and His praise in the congregation of the saints. We end this psalm of praise exactly as we began. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 